There we go. Welcome to those of you who have come into the don't, don't be, come into the show late. <laughs> Turn off your cell phones and don't have wrinkly candy wrappers either. What? Um, you could hold one of those, the, either the X or Z component constant or something. But say you wanted to make another one that was at 200. Yeah. And it would just change your Z up. Yeah, that, that changes the unknown. We can handle two unknowns with this. Uh, I actually could handle three. I, uh, I think because it's three dimensional. Um, so that just means that one of these becomes known and part of that becomes unknown. So it depends on what the design purpose is of what you're trying to do there. Okay. Chris, could you put the light back on, please? Sure. That was just wrap up from the other day, so I guess it's okay I didn't start the tape. Still didn't understand why I had a six minute tape the other day. So. I don't know what that was. Okay, so we're rolling. All right. So we're making our next step with this. And we, we've kind of been touching on it anyway. But now we're going to make it formal and actually work with it. Um, and we're going to do something. Uh, the, the way we're going to use it is very important to the whole rest of this class and very much into what we're going to do next term in Strength and Materials. And that's that we're now going to establish the situation of static equilibrium in our problems. We've touched on it a little bit. Uh, we even kind of, I think, uh, even did a problem with it. That's the business where we need to make sure that once we take into account all of the forces in a problem, all of those forces sum to zero. Whatever force we've got in any direction, there's something also in the problem that negates that and is true for all of the possible directions in the problems that we're looking at. So that we can guarantee that our object is in equilibrium uh, Technically, it just says that acceleration is equal to zero. Usually, that means also that the velocity is equal to zero, as with structures, buildings, bridges, uh, cell towers, those kind of things. We don't want those to not only not accelerate, we don't want them to move. We also can add to this the fact, though, that we don't want the moments to have any contribution any total contribution either. We also need those moments to balance. Remember, that's the, the effect of the forces such that they tend to turn the object and we don't want that object to turn in any way either. So if, if you remember from Physics 1, in a later part of the term when we did a little bit of uh, uh, when we got off of particle motion, started talking about rigid body motion, we didn't want things to have any angular acceleration. Uh, we don't want to have any angular acceleration here either. Typically, that means sort of the same thing that we actually don't want to have any angular velocity. But those aren't guaranteed with what we're doing here. Only the acceleration being zero is guaranteed with what we're doing here. So other steps may need to be taken to guarantee that not only is there no acceleration, uh, but there's no velocity either. So uh, what's this mean to us then? For full three-dimensional problems, As we try to solve these problems for any unknowns, which could be uh, we don't know what missing force there is that we need to ensure equilibrium. We might not know where to put that force to ensure equilibrium. Um, any of those type of things are possible. How many equations do we have so we know how many unknowns we can even address? For a full three-dimensional problem, the type you're probably going to hit in real life, 
because that's where real life is in three dimensions. How many, uh, how many equations do we have? These are our governing equations. That's all we've got. We've got nothing else available to us. In fact, uh, that's this class. We're done. You're not going to learn anything new from here on out. Bill says, all right, I have a half a chance. I may not have to wear a hat the whole semester. How many equations do we have there? Because then I know how many unknowns we could possibly address. Looks to me like two equations, I can handle two unknowns. You want me to commit that to the board? No. Yeah. yeah, two. How many equations is that? Is there six? Is There's there six equations there. Because this needs to be true in each of the ordinal directions. So as we typically do it, all the x forces must sum to zero and the y and the z. We don't want any parts of those equal to zero. Now, notice notice now there's no uh, no vector sign on there because the, uh, the direction's already in hand with the x, y, and the z. But we don't want any moment in any of the directions either. So this, in a full-blown problem, is actually six available equations, we could handle six unknowns. And <coughs> no reason you couldn't do a problem like that other than <coughs> other than they do get a little more complicated. They're harder to visualize, especially on, on 2D paper and 2D boards. They're a little bit harder to visualize. And if you have six equations and six unknowns, you got yourself a nice system of equations that's going to take a while to solve, probably. But if you're taking linear algebra, is anybody, or is that next term? You're taking that now? Uh, you can, one of the quickest ways to solve a system of six equations, six unknowns, is with matrix algebra. That's one of the easiest ways to do it, especially since most of the calculators can do that. For you. All you have to do, of course, and I love it when professors say that all you have to do is set it up right. Once you set it up right, then you can do all of the problems. All right, most of our problems are going to be 2D. <coughs> so, now how many equations are available to us? Typically four. However, let's see. Um, if it's if it's our usual x and y is in the board, then we'll certainly have those two equations. Some of the forces in the x will be zero. Some of the forces in the y will be zero. Those those are certainly available to us. Uh, in, in problems. Well, uh, what else then? There's there's two. What are the four? Let's see. Here's x. Here's y. So we have some problem, some two-dimensional problem. That means the object and all of its forces. And the effect of all the forces are such that, that, that everything's in 2D. Uh, all the object and the forces are certainly in the plane of the board. Whatever I can draw, whether it's a, a bridge or a tower or a car part or whatever. So, what are the other two equations? Yeah, it's got. A, well, that's all we got left. Uh, we can't use this. Why not? We don't have any z forces. There, that's identically zero. If you do this, all you're going to get is zero equals zero, and that doesn't need confirmation. We're pretty sure that holds, that zero equals zero. So don't bother with it. This one's not even available. Uh, 
that one's not even available to us. <coughs> so we've got uh, forces that have to lie in the plane and where they are with respect to whatever point, we usually put the origin right at the point just to make things simple. Uh, where are those forces at also lies in the xy plane. So we have no z forces we're not going to have any moments about the x-axis or moments about the y-axis. These will also be identically zero. So we only have three equations in a 2D problem. because we won't have any moments about the x-axis because we need a z component of the force to do that. We don't have any z components. And same for the y-axis. Everybody grasp that? It's not, it's not obvious. You know, most, most of you are all set to say four equations, but uh, two of them because of the 2D nature, drop out automatically, uh, as well as, as our third, so we only have three equations. However, uh, we do have a little adjustment that we can make for the three equations. A lot of times, and we'll see that coming up here, we don't even have any Y forces in some of our problems. For example, uh, we're going to do a very simple problem and it looks basically like this. And this will be the, the most basic of all the types of problems we can do. We're going to look at a beam under loading and being supported such that it's in equilibrium. So uh, if this is a, a, a piece of a floor, a piece of the beam that goes across the floor here, and we've got a couple of you sitting on it here. So there's the load. And you're sitting on the floor, and the force is directed straight down anyway. So uh, the beam and the forces are perpendicular. That's exactly what you're doing right now without even thinking about it. <coughs> and quite likely, we want to support the beam probably at the two ends that attaches at each end of the walls there. Uh, next term, we're going to look at the fact that these beams could bend under that load. And it could be they bend so far they come loose. We want to prevent that kind of thing too because then they start accelerating. If we lose one of these supports, then we have a beam that's accelerating. It's fun for a little while. <laughs> Uh, but for right now, our beams are inelastic. They do not bend. We'll look at elastic medium. All of our design materials are elastic, uh, with minor exceptions next term, because the idea is being as, as you come in here, they bend a little bit. But that's in the design. We can handle that. We don't want too many people in here. That's why almost all rooms have a capacity load that sometimes is posted. That's what the posting means. It's either that or the fire department doesn't think enough people can get out fast enough. But in terms of load capacity, like on the elevators, it's what the load, it's what that structure can handle and not fail. And so we, we can take people in here. That'll cause these beams to sag a little bit. Not very much. I don't think any of you noticed it when you came in. Somebody in the hall, I have to go get there. So. Was her ginger? She's running. You better run. <laughs> um, but when you leave and the load's gone, it returns to its original shape because it's elastic. So we'll design everything within the elastic range so they can sag a little bit, but then they can return to where they were before. We would want them to sag and stay there, and then the next group comes in and sags a little bit more, and it sags a little bit more, 
So uh, for now, though, all our beams are inelastic. There's no sagging going on here with these beams. That's the real thing, but we'll hit that next turn. Also, unless you're told otherwise, and it's going to be a couple weeks before we get there, uh, there's no mass to these beams either. So they're inelastic and they're massless, which they're not cheap down at Ace Hardware. <laughs> but for you guys, I spare no expense. So we could have a problem like this. It's exactly what's going on right now, especially if I'd hold still, since I'm moving around a lot, we do get some X direction forces, but for the most part, there's only Y direction forces here. So we can't use this equation either. But we might still need three equations, depending on what's going on here and the problem. Uh, we only have two unknowns, how big to make this support and how big to make this support. But we could have a three, a third, because we might not know where those are. We might need to place them somewhere. So we do have another possibility for three equations in a 2D problem. So just for reference, I'll label this side A and side B. Uh, we could also have, of course, all the Y forces have to sum to zero. Assuming again, X is horizontal, Y is vertical. Uh, so we, we certainly need, it's, I hope it's obvious that for all the down forces we've got here, we need just as much up force or the beam's not going to be in equilibrium. You can just look at that and sense that that's true. Um, we can't use some of the forces in the X direction. We don't have any. But we might have two other, two other uh, unknowns still in the problem, so we might need three equations. Now, all in our two-dimensional problems, we can only have moments in the z-direction. Nothing else is possible. It's just not possible to go any other direction in the moments but in the z-direction. This thing's either going to turn clockwise or counterclockwise in terms of the moments. There's nothing else possible. So uh, that's there, but we can actually use it twice in two ways. For example, for this type of problem, we could sum the moments about A, and they'll be in the Z direction because there's no other possibility, so I'm not even going to put the Z down, and those moments must sum to zero. Now, that's the idea that we know A won't fail. Well, let's, um, we assume A won't fail. We're only concerned about the support at B. So if A is not going to fail, it's not that end's not going anywhere. The only other possibility is that this beam is going to go in that way. If B's not big enough, and that's what would happen if B failed. You know, we're we're, we're over there with some some gum and 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 maybe a couple of sheetrock screws trying to hold in that end of the beam over there. That's why I stand up here. Uh, that's what would happen. If that support failed, that's what the beam's going to do. So uh, we certainly want these, the moments about A to be zero. Assuming, it's just to have to assume in our minds, A is good enough, what's B going to be? And then we could find out what B is going to be that way. Uh, we wouldn't want B too big because I guess it could push it up. We wouldn't want to put a rocket motor under there because once everybody leaves, then that rocket motor is too big. In case you're, I wonder why they don't use rocket motors in, in, in buildings to hold on. That'd be pretty cool. Well, that is why we don't do that. We don't want B to be too big and cause the beam to go up on that end. So we don't want the moments about A to be anything but zero total. So uh, there's a moment caused by that force and one caused by this force in the clockwise direction. Here's a moment in the counterclockwise direction. It's got to be just the right size to counteract those two moments. So there's our other equation. We'll sum the moments about A. Where's the third equation? 
we wanted the same thinking over it. I mean, it's arbitrary which one I number A and B, so we also might want to sum the moments about B. This will work for us only if A and B aren't lined up with each other. Because if they're lined up with each other, which would be kind of stupid in this problem anyway, uh, then those are indistinguishable from each other. So um, I guess we'd say uh, uh, if horizontal is x, we don't want x a to equal x b, which would be a really stupid problem anyway. Then then we've got a, a beam like this with two people standing there. And we're trying to do A and B like that somehow when they line up. So good luck with that design anyway. So we could handle that type of thing. There's also one other possibility. We could sum the moment about any three points. If those three points are one, not collinear, they don't line a straight line with each other, and um, I don't think there's two L's on there. There might be two L's. Uh, they can't be collinear, and they can't be. Uh, such that the any two x components are the same or the y components are the same. So x, a, b, and c can't equal each other. And same thing in the y direction. Then we could do uh, then we could do it um, but we won't have many problems like that. That's such that we have some two-dimensional piece. You know, these beams, they certainly have a length. They don't necessarily have any width to them, especially if we're not worried about their mass. But we could have a problem with three points. And as long as they're not collinear and don't line up with each other in either of the directions, then we could use the moment equations about each of those. Uh, do each of them separately. That could give us three, three equations, three unknowns. But we won't have too many of those, so that's just sort of a side point. All right, so here's the type of problem we're going to be looking for. So here's a beam of some certain length that uh, turns out to be five meters. And at the three meter, two meter spot, three meters on that side, two meters on that side, we have uh, two kilonewtons. Is that a person? Sure. Could be my mother-in-law. Just kidding, Nana. Remember that? That's what's a Newton way about? Yeah, yeah about it. So that's about two thousand apples. So that's a that's a pretty big crate. So that's a couple students in here, or one student with a big ego. So that can, so uh, certainly possible. We we take it to be a point load, even though that's not even the case of you, because you're sitting in a chair and the chair's got four different points of contact, even your feet taken a little bit, uh, even as I stand here, I have all my weight not at two single points in my feet, but spread over my feet, even though they're, they're small and, and very delicate feet, I don't have big feet at all, that's why I was a good soccer player in my day, because I have small feet, just like Franz Beckenbauer. <laughs> Anybody know Franz Beckenbauer? Five and a half shoe. And he was 5'8". He's a top 
He, he was great. Okay, now, uh, we can look at this, of course, and say, oh yeah, I know that, that thing there is not in equilibrium. So we need to support it. So here's how we support it in our, in our minds. We're going to uh, we're going to pin this end. Uh, this, is, this is our usual support. We're going to see we have several. We're going to pin that end. That means it can freely turn around that so that uh, we then support it with uh, something at that point. And that's, a, that's, just, that's our symbol for a freely pinned end such that it can't go up. It can't go sideways, but it could turn. If we want that end to not turn either, which certainly would be part of the design, then what we have to do is take the beam and embed it in a wall. Now, that beam can't go up, can't go sideways, nor can it turn. And you can see what the effect would be if we if we did load if we did let these beams sag, this beam would sag by going like that. It would actually turn about that point and then drop down as the beam sag. This beam, when it got loaded somehow, wouldn't drop down, nor would it turn. So it would sag like that. Notice how it doesn't even turn there. That's a completely different type of mounting. And we've got to look at all of these. We've got to figure out what all these different parts mean. This is called cantilever. If, if the beam is, is free, like that, kind of like a diving board uh, stuck into a wall, or a porch might be. This is called cantilevered when it's embedded at one end. Can't go up or down, can't go sideways, nor can it turn. This is just pinned. Uh, neither of these is exactly what's, well, this is a lot closer to what's done here. This is not very common in structures. However, it's the most conservative design to look at. Uh, if we only guard them against moving and don't guard them against turning, then we'll over-design our building and then when we build it this way, it's even stronger than we designed it for. So uh, we'll do a lot of just these pinned supports as, uh, as our standard, most common type of uh, support. So I'll just draw a little triangle there that's sitting on something. You know that to be a simple pinned support. Now, uh, since it can turn at that end, we need to support at the other end or it's going to start to accelerate. So we'll put, uh, uh, what we'll draw is something like that. That's a little roller support. What that does for us is it keeps it from going up or down. It doesn't keep it from going left or right. So as this beam starts to sag, that end could move in a little bit because the total length of the beam is the same. It doesn't, it doesn't actually stretch in length, it just bends a little bit. So that's what that roller support meant to represent. The, the trouble for us is when we replace those supports with the supporting forces they offer, because if we're going to sum the forces, we need all the forces on a free body diagram. So we're going to take these support, supported beams, take out the supports and put in the forces they offer. So this one keeps it from going up and down or left and right, so it actually has that kind of supporting force. And I have to pick it in one direction, or I'm not going to put a force that's going in two directions. So I pick, pick one direction here. And maybe this is A. 
So this is A in the Y direction. Here's A in the X direction. It's actually true that those are just the components of the single force that that support can exert. So we have one end pinned, and because it's pinned, there's, to our eyes, two unknowns. The support in the X direction and the support in the Y direction. This type of support only keeps things from going up or down, not left or right. So that would be B. Uh, since there's no horizontal component, we don't even have to put BY, because there is no BX. But you can if you want. It's not going to hurt anything. And it does help you keep things straight in it when, we, when we sum equations. So there's, a very, there's our simplest problem with three unknowns. One, two, and three. That's our simplest problem with three unknowns. We only have three equations available. That's why we have to put the roller support here. If we also pin this end, we'd have a fourth unknown, but not a fourth equation. And we couldn't solve it. Those problems are known as statically indeterminate. We can't solve those yet. Next term, we will be able to. We could put a fourth force in here, force support force, which is much more realistic. These beams that make up this floor, bless you, uh, we don't have one end on a roller. They're both pinned at both ends. Next term, we will have another equation to use, and it's the fact that we know how these pieces are going to actually deform, and we'll use that as our fourth equation because we'll uh, say, we don't want these to deform. I don't want this end to move at all, even though the beam's going to bend. And I'll be able to figure, I'll be able to use that next term as a fourth equation, and we'll be able to do four unknowns. Right now, we only have three equations in 2D. We can only handle three unknowns. And that's all. That's why there's a roller at this end. Uh, in real life, this kind of thing is done because in real life, especially with bridges, there can be thermal expansion. They build a bridge in summer when it's 90 degrees, and then six months later it's minus 20 degrees. That bridge, those bri that bridge, and each of the members in the bridge are going to shrink because of the, the cold. Guys, things shrink when it gets cold. So uh, you'll see on bridges that there's what are called expansion joints. And that's where, as you drive over the bridge, you see that there's this piece that looks like this. Now we're looking down at the bridge from above. There's a, there's a joint in the bridge kind of like that. That allows thermal expansion, which we'll also be able to figure out next term uh, if we have enough time to look into thermal uh, effects of these. And uh, it's, it's not straight like that because then it doesn't catch bicycle tires or other things. It uh, keeps stuff from falling down there a little bit better. But in the, uh, in the summer, that gap's pretty tight. In the winter, that gap's a little bit bigger. Maybe enough to even see the difference if, if you want to go on a bridge and stand in the middle of the traffic and, and look at that as the last thing you do. <laughs> All right, so, so there's, there's our simplest problem for now. Um, who has a, may I borrow your book for a second? Yep. Just, just so you know what we're doing here, this is actually, I believe, chapter three we're on now. Chapter 3. Wolf vision. Uh, on Chapter 3, there's two tables. Yeah. There's two.
two tables. Uh, the first one's on page 111, and it is a table of the type of reactions, uh, the type of supports we would have. And that's what's down on the left side. Um, here's, here's the roller support, and here's two other ways we can do exactly the same thing. And the roller support only supplies a single normal reaction. That's what I had there. It doesn't keep things from going left or right. It just keeps them from going up or down. Uh, you'd, you'd think that the N could go up here, but that's just so uncommon in our problems. But we take it to keep things from going up, too. Because if that was the case, uh, we could flip these over, and then they wouldn't go up. Uh, remember, there's no mass on on any of these problems here. Um, so we have, you know, cables, we've done that kind of thing. Smooth surfaces, if there's a little bit of friction, there's a horizontal possible component to it. Uh, we have a, a possibly a freely sliding guide, that would keep things from going up or down. And on the next page, the table's continued. And there's our most common one, and that's what I put on the left side here, just a simple pin connection. And we replace it with the two vertical components, I mean the two ordinal components, take that to be two unknowns. Because uh, it's really a single force, we don't know the magnitude or the direction, that's also two unknowns. So there's no difference here whether we do it in the components or as a total force, either way there's two unknowns there. Here's the cantilever or embedded support. Notice it keeps things from going up or down, left or right, and keeps from turning things. Because that kind of support exerts a moment itself. So as a load's trying to turn it one way, the support's turning it back the other way. Such that <coughs> the moment's summed to zero. So that's how we're going to be able to find the size of the moment the wall supplies so we can make sure that's big enough and then uh, uh, if things do have mass we'll be able to put that force in we're not there yet but we will be in a little bit and uh, we, we could even spring load some of these things so keep an eye on that uh, that table 111 until you get more used to these things as the type of forces exerted by the different types of supports. So that's page 111 and 112. Thanks, sir. You can play my favorite student. Okay, so back to this problem here. Let's look at it it and what we want to do. So these supporting forces are called the reactions because it's the, the support's reaction to the fact that there's a load on this. We have a load there, two kilonewtons. For every action there's an equal and opposite reaction so that two kilonewtons is pushing the beam down onto the supports. The supports are pushing back in reaction. So these are known as the reactions. A Y, A X, A B, and uh, B. We'll, we'll, we'll put B Y for now. And we need to find those three unknowns, the three reaction components. So we can sum the forces in the x direction. Who wants to take the easy one? There's only one force in the x direction. It must be zero. Otherwise, the forces in the x direction won't sum to zero. So, uh, e even though this will keep this end from going left or right, in our simplest of all pictures, that's not a concern. 
In real life it might be, but we're not quite there yet. Sum the forces in the y direction. Since our sums will always be to zero, I think it's a lot easier to say all of the down forces must equal all of the up forces, and then we don't have any minus signs in the problem. Algebraically, it's just the same. Uh, AY plus BY minus 2 or other way around is the same as saying AY plus BY equals 2 kilonewtons. So I like to do that. All the up forces equal all the down forces. Then there's no minus signs. We don't have any words. It's always going to be true for the statics class. That that's the type of thing we can do. All right, there's one equation, two unknowns. We're not done yet. So we have to sum the moments about some point. Which point? It doesn't matter. We don't want the moments to be anything but zero about any point. And that's what I kind of said here. I didn't say where A and B are. I said where they couldn't be, but I didn't say where they can be. They can be anywhere. So some of the moments about either point. A lot of times there's one point that's easier than others mathematically. But it's got to be about any point. It doesn't matter what you pick. If we picked point A, we have two forces going through point A. They won't appear in the moment equation because they exert no moment about A. Oh, well, this one we already know is zero. But if we didn't, if we had a problem where this wasn't a vertical force, it had a horizontal component to it, this wouldn't be zero. We could sum the moments about A. Neither one of those contribute, only B does. And we wouldn't, uh, we'd have a simpler problem mathematically. Doesn't change the physics, it's just a little simpler mathematically. So, Again, uh, like we did with the force equation, where all the up forces equal all the down forces, here we can say all the clockwise moments equal all the counterclockwise moments. Separate them on either side, and uh, we won't have any minus signs. So this is tending to make a clockwise moment about A to the tune of two kilonewtons out at a distance of three meters from A. Since these are all perpendicular anyway, so that makes it easy. That's the clockwise moments, and those must equal all the counterclockwise moments, which of course is our unknown BY. And its moment are 5 meters, not just 2, it's all the way, it's 5 meters away from A. So now we can solve for B, then we can go back and solve for A, Y, and we're all done. With this, our most simple type problem. And of course, they're going to get a little more involved as all of them. Basically, that's, that's everything there.